Flying Bull Productions presents Laugh, Literature, and Film. All right, it's the good stuff. Yeah. It's the Laugh Podcast. Welcome to the Laugh Podcast Movie of the Year show. Hey. Episode 119. Over there is Mr. Uh, Two Frames. Howdy. I'm the L Train. This movie for both of us was our number one pick of the year. It stars uh, Emily Blunt as FBI agent, idealistic FBI agent Kate Macer, who receives a top assignment working with uh, Matt Graver, played by Josh Brolin, and his bird dog, Alejandro. Played by Benicio Del Toro. The State Department is pulling an agent that specializes in responding to escalating cartel activity. This is not my department. FBI! You want to be a part of this? Do we get an opportunity of the men responsible for today? The men who are really responsible for today. Been to what is before? We're going to El Paso, right? You're not American. <clears throat> what do you work for now? Well, I go where I'm sent. Every day across that border, people are killed with his blessing. To find them would be like discovering a vaccine. Nothing will make sense to your American ears. But in the end, you will understand. Spotter vehicle, left lane. Spotter vehicle, 9 o'clock. Get your weapon out. I'm not a soldier. This is not what I do. What is this? What happens when they dig in? This is it. Gotta be careful around these people. CIA is not supposed to work this side. It's directed by Denis Villeneuve. I don't know how to pronounce that. It was pretty close, though. Yeah, it sounds pretty good. Last movie, I think, was Prisoners or Enemy. It came out Enemy. in the same year, but um, he's attached to the Blade Runner sequel that's coming up. Yeah, he's also got another film coming out this year. Um, he did Incendies. He, you yeah. seen that movie? I haven't seen that. That was nominated for Best Foreign Film. Uh, this year he's got Story of Your Life with Amy Adams and Jeremy Renner coming out. A science fiction film about an interpreter who has to talk to the aliens. Ooh. That I, It's just got a release date of 2016. We don't know when in the year it's coming out awesome. yet. But looking forward to that. Screenplay for Sicario was uh, Taylor Sheridan. And the cinematography was by Roger Deakins. This is, uh, he's nominated for an Oscar for this. There's only three Oscar nominations for Sicario. Among them uh, is cinematographer or best cinematography. Hopefully Deakins finally wins. He's been nominated 13 Mm -hmm. times. Lucky 13 (laughs) for Mr. Uh, Deakins. And that was, this is an intense movie to watch, but the cinematography is really good. It's really crisp. A lot of brilliant sort of colors that are, in between different scenes, they have meaning. Oh, yeah. So, uh, well, just the composition. There's a shot pretty early on of the plane flying, uh, you know, along the ground. You see the shadow of uh-huh. it yeah. on this vast landscape, and it's a tiny, tiny little shadow. And inside this shadow is the plane that's carrying all these guys who are going to try and fight the, the war on drugs. And you're like, wow, they've got their task cut out for him yeah this is ostensibly a movie or not ostensibly this is actually a movie about the war on drugs and the border between uh, america and mexico and the border war that's going on down there uh at a key point in the movie this idealistic uh, kate macer starts to question everything that's going on around her and she asks graver's bird dog this alejandro played by benicio del toro um you know what's going on here what am i what are we doing uh as an audience, we sort of understand that point of view because we're often confused in this movie and we have to sit in that seat that she occupies for much of the film. And then Alejandra says to her, nothing would make sense to your American ears and you will doubt everything that we do. But in the end, 
you will understand. And my question to you is, do you think the movie makes good on that promise? Oh, I mean, I've said before that I feel that you can watch this movie and be pro-aggressive tactics and fighting the war on drugs and you can be you know, against it. I think this is a movie for both liberals and conservatives and they can find uh, parts of the movie for their side of the argument. Well, do you think that she understands? That she understands? Ooh. I know this This gets into spoilers. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Maybe that, that, that final that scene is really important. Or do we just want to make this a spoiler-free zone? Uh, probably. Uh, I think we're better off going spoiler-free. I will say she goes back and forth. At times, she's all aboard on this and doing what's necessary. There are other times where she doesn't. And, I, I mean, personally, I feel that the points where she's like, no, this is ridiculous. What are we doing? Those are the parts where I, I feel her character comes off as wishy-washy and not nearly as strong. A little melodramatic in the writing as well. Yeah. I, I'm trying to think of the key points where she she she, she really questions things. Uh, and the questions come out of her knowledge, what she learns. The, those things that you referenced then have a little bit less of an impact than when she's questioning from a point of ambiguity. Mm-hmm. Because for the most most of the movie, we're really confused. We're confused visually what's going on, and then that plays out in the key scene later on in the movie. Uh, we'll just say the tunnel scene. Mm. And um, But for most of the movie, she's swimming in this sort of dark pool, and she's only occasionally getting her head up above water. And I feel, as a person, like viewing the film in the audience, I'm amazed at how much I associated with this this woman not because i'm male and she's woman but just because it's hard for me to to have that sort of empathy for a character in most movies well i mean she's our conduit as she learns stuff we learn it at the same time there are very few scenes with dialogue at least that right. she's not in yeah yeah that um, makes there's an interrogation scene and then towards the end there's after the tunnel there's yeah but that, some i think what i'm getting at then is all along, we are forced to deal with our own interpretation of events and our own uh, our own response to mm-hmm. things. And and Villeneuve, in this film and in his other films, does a really good job of setting up a moral argument, putting you in the position of having to make a choice, and then questioning yourself as to whether or not you would do the thing that this person does. A movie that can ask you to question your own ethical choices and decisions is a pretty powerful thing. So yeah. the the movie kind of puts you in a crucible of your own conscience. Yeah, and I I love that he has taken the premise of the TV show Alias, which had a female protagonist, Jennifer Gardner, who worked for this spy agency, and uh-huh. she wasn't always sure what she was doing. Her boss was played by uh, this guy, Victor Garber who plays Emily Blunt's FBI boss at this film. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So while I was watching, I, I was always like, wow, this is a riff on Alias, but they've elevated the material. Oh, you think that's what it was? I never saw Alias, so. Well, I mean, I'm watching. I, I'm like, well, you know. So it's an independent, illusion. Yeah. yeah. Huh. It, he, they had to be aware of what they were doing when they hired uh, Victor Garber. And I really, really like that guy. He, he's a lot of fun. He's on uh, Heroes of Tomorrow on the WB or whatever that is. Uh-huh. That there are guy. a lot of, I don't know if he is in the Marvel universe. Is he DC? Well, a lot of these actors are in the Marvel universe. Mm-hmm. A lot of these characters, uh, John Berenthal, Josh Brolin, Maximiliano Hernandez plays, uh, agent Stillwell or sit well. You could call me that. Cause I sit pretty well. I think I'm pretty good at sitting. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it, one of my skills. There are a lot of really small performances that I think are strong. When they're doing the border crossing, there's a operator that they hook up with, wears glasses, has a bad mustache, mm-hmm. makes really bad jokes. He seems kind of crude, but yeah, when the I action thought, happens, man, he is good with a gun. Uh, and I mean, it's very, very believable action. I mean, you feel like these guys are professionals and yeah. they know what their job is. I thought that guy was Littlefinger from uh, Game of Thrones. Yeah, he, he looks a lot like him. But it, it's a quick performance and then the guy's gone. And there are a lot of moments like that in the film. When you, um, what, did you have that same experience I had of like questioning what you would do in this 
what decision you would make if you were her mm-hmm. or if you were she. If well, she I mean, that, that's definitely yeah. what this director is great at doing. I mean, he did that with prisoners. How far would you go to try and find your kidnapped daughter? Yeah, it's like the trolleyology. Yeah. The moral questions. I think uh, Enemy works like that, too. I mean, how far would you go? What would you, what track would you take? And once you've made this choice, you got to do this thing. You're going to have to deal with mm-hmm. the consequences of it. But then, I mean, there's also great moments of uh, realism. There, there's a point where Emily Blunt points a gun at the character and things don't go well for her. Right, and they probably it, shouldn't. Yeah, it, it, she gets told to never point a gun at this person right. again. And I'm like, that's exactly how that scene should have played out. And it never plays out like that in any other Hollywood film. Right. Yeah. We're, I we're really, dealing with really a, enjoy that. We're dealing with a different set of expectations from this director. I mean, in a different way of telling the story. It feels very, very grounded in reality. You may not agree with these people's methods and their principles, but you agree that there are people like this in the world doing this job. Well, maybe you do. Maybe you don't. I mean, it all depends on who you are, really. Oh, I think there are people who are doing this sort of stuff. No, but I don't think that, that everyone like agrees with who they are. Or, or agrees that they, that they should. should. Not, not, yeah, no, yeah. I, I didn't say that oh. people agree that they should. I'm just saying people agree that there are this situation exists. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if I like any. I mean, I like Emily Blunt, but I don't know if I like Kate Maser. <laughs> I don't know if I like any of these characters. Like, like them. I don't know if I'm supposed to, obviously. The... Uh, Josh Brolin character or Alejandro played by Benicio del Toro. I don't think we're supposed to like them. I respect their abilities. <laughs> uh, graver at manipulating people. And plus, he's kind of funny. That's the thing. This movie has a sense of humor, even though it's dark and um, ironic. It still allows you to, I don't know, have a little bit of release uh, as you're watching it. It's not just intensity, 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 intensity. So the the pacing of it is broken up by these little parts of ironic humor that make me really surprised that it's not a Best Picture nomination. I, I, I don't know what's wrong with it, aside from the message. It got really good reviews. Yeah. Um, did all right in the box office. Didn't find a huge audience. But I think, it, I think it got overshadowed by The Martian coming out right about the same time. It, I mean, when you compare it, that's, that's the whole thing. We'll talk more about Best Pictures as we do the mm-hmm. Laugh Goes to the Oscars shows. But a movie like Bridge of Spies or Brooklyn, yeah, fine movies. They just don't seem to have the same impact that a movie like uh, this does on the personal psyche. Like, you don't have to examine your conscience. You don't have to. If you're watching those things, it's fine, whatever. Oh, I might make this choice. The, the choices that you have to make in Brooklyn are <laughs> are not life and death choices necessarily. It's like, are you going to sleep in the couch or on the bed? <laughs> you know, you're still going to go to sleep, be happy and comfortable here. You have to choose whether or not you're going to, you know, yeah, but this is kill a, somebody or kill yourself. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things that works against this movie is it's not much of a date movie. It's rated R. It's not a movie for children. Mm-mm. Maybe. I mean, if you have a mature high schooler, you can let them watch it, but I, I wouldn't show it to other age groups would you show selected scenes Ooh. or does the scene do the movies need the trappings or the other external um elements of the story for those scenes to work those uh scenes of i'm thinking of the key i don't know if you'd call them set pieces there's the there's the on the bridge there's the cold open which is probably the best or one of the best opens of film this year mm-hmm. Um, in that open, uh, Macer is an FBI agent on a SWAT team, and they're going to find some kidnapped hostages. And through a variety of mishaps, they realize that they've bitten off quite a bit more than they thought they'd have to chew. Yeah, this isn't an isolated crime. No. And it's pretty gruesome and intense, but there are some key you know, action things that go on in that scene and then she's dropped right into the situation where she's confused about um her involvement later on then they go to uh capture to to somewhat she's her motivation is to get the revenge for the events that happened in the first in the cold open and she goes over there to mexico juarez Mm -hmm. 
to uh, get the person responsible on the way back, there's this intense bridge sequence like this action suspense sequence of where there are people coming to rescue this individual and there's the FBI and CIA agents who are on you know, the bridge. Get your service weapon out. Gun. Gun. Gun left. What are the rules here? Stay in your vehicle. You can do what they do. If they get out, you get out. Move! Wait, wait, wait. wait. Get out of the car. Two spots. Don't move. Come with it. No, 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 no. Compass, compass. Suelta la pistola. Tírela. Pregunta, paisanos. Quiere morir. So, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you would show that scene, or does it need to have all that other setup? I don't know if I could show that just because. All of that stuff is R-rated. I mean, there's some language stuff. There's there's some bodies hanging from the bridge in that scene. That well, that's been mutilated. Yeah, I guess that's going. And over. I don't know. Yeah, but I don't know if you can cut that. I, I I don't know if you can just have the climax of that scene okay. and show it. I would like to be able to show stuff like that. I would recommend this to kids to go watch who are mature enough, you know. And I teach a film class to 17 and 18 year olds, so I mean, they can also legally watch this film. So I don't feel bad about recommending it, but I would be careful. I, I don't tell my ninth graders about this film. I don't think they're ready for it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they could appreciate it. I mean, it is a bit slow at times. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to enjoy character development and there's a lot of subtlety. Like Benicio del Toro says very little with his voice. His mannerisms speak highly of it. Um, speak with your words. Villanueva uh, estimates they cut 90% of Benicio Del Toro's dialogue. Mm -hmm. And apparently the writer wasn't super happy about that. But I think it makes Del Toro's character stronger. And oh. he's not explaining every little thing about him. All of his background, his yeah. motivations. His torture techniques. Yeah. <laughs> Involve proximity. Yeah. Instead, so. you just get little hints through some conversations he has and then at the end of the movie some more stuff gets spelled out for you finally but i don't know i'd like to teach this movie i just don't think i can teach it to high schoolers well i mean i guess would you could you pull those scenes out and show them as isolated scenes not not to necessarily film students or like but i'm thinking to your dad or uh mm -hmm. you know a person who hasn't seen the film would you could you pull out one of those scenes and say, hey, this is why you should go see that? Or would it not make sense? I, I think if you wanted to out of try and convince someone to watch this film and you wanted to show them a scene, you show them that opening scene. Then I you mean, know if you're in or not. Yeah, I mean, if that works for you, you're going to like the whole movie. If the opening scene doesn't work for you, turn it off. Well, on a rewatching of the movie, I noticed that the B story was sort of annoying and grating. I understand why it's there. And it needs to be there. I'm talking about the intersecting story involving uh, Maximiliano, Maximiliano Hernandez, who plays Agent Stillwell in the movie. I can't remember his name in this, but he's a cop in Juarez, crooked cop in Juarez. And he has to do he has to make certain decisions in his life to make ends meet, mm -hmm. to provide for his family. And his story intersects with the main story and the Alejandro character. Um, they meet up later in the film and then uh, it sort of unravels for this guy. The whole, everything about that needs to be in the film for the film to have the impact it wants to have. But then you know, most things about it were sort of melodramatic and just sort of uh, oversimplified for me. Uh, I can see your argument. I do think that there's enough payoff towards the end of the film. And again, I mean, I we've decided not to do spoilers, but I do think there's enough of an intersection there. and I, No, I, I meant we could spoil everything. Oh, we are doing spoilers. That's what I meant by spoiler free. I thought that means free of spoilers. Oh. Now not, not we're going to provide the spoilers for free. 
No, how about then we go into spoilers then? All right. All right, so let's just give a general overview is go out and see Sicario because it's the last podcast movie of the year. Mm -hmm. Some of the best action scenes, uh, great story, uh, great drink movie. Go watch this movie with someone and And then enjoy enjoy a beverage afterwards and discuss it. Oh, okay. You like that. That's, That's a thing for you. Those are some of my favorite movies to recommend to people, movies that make you think, movies that even a couple days later, you're still replaying in your mind, you're still grappling with. You want to talk about them. Yeah. Discuss. All right, so uh, let's get into spoilers so you can talk about this B story. So, Maximiliano Hernandez's character. Uh, I don't think it's just pure melodrama. I think the director is trying to flesh out the story and provide, you know, all the sides of it so that again if you're liberal you have stuff to argue your point and if you're conservative you have stuff to argue your point i guess i'm thinking about the child constantly asking father can we go play soccer in the you know in the field and the fact that he smokes the same brand of cigarettes that she smokes they're all the same yeah they're all a little corrupt is that heavy-handed or do you have to have him like focus on what was it called? Indian Creek or Indian Head cigarettes mm-hmm. to have that close up, or can they just be smoking, or is that just not enough of a reference? I guess they felt it wasn't enough of a reference at first. Though I also thought he was just like a drunk, deadbeat, and he didn't really realize that he's just this hardworking guy. And the reason why he's so exhausted in the morning because he's is working because all he's night. been working all night, Mule to try and drugs, and, trying to provide for his family, trying to stay alive. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, he is a cop, though. I mean, he still has that job. Yeah, who was... Yeah, I think this movie said in the late aughts, so there were 3,000 murders a year in the city. <laughs> the city of Juarez. And apparently the city of Juarez is upset because they're like, we've cleaned up our act since then. We're having slightly less than 500 murders a year now, <laughs> which is still a staggering total. The The sprawl of that city, and I guess they had some real shots that they used. That's amazing. I'm sure that when they were going through the streets of Juarez, that had to have been somewhere in Colombia or Costa Rica or something like that. They couldn't have gotten permission to go into Mexico. That, Like, if anyone had seen the script of this, yeah, we're going to make a movie about your fair city here, and it's all about corruption and within your <laughs> higher offices, colluding with the American government and CIA forces to have private citizens be, you know, assassinated. I, I, I don't... They don't... Ass- the, the FBI doesn't assassinate anyone. What? Alejandro assassinate? I mean, he's a... Oh, he, that, but he, they're not working the with the government officials. I thought you meant when they did the prisoner transfer. They just well, turned no, over a prisoner to torture him. Yeah, but it, it leads to the assassination, and I, don't, I think that they're okay with it. I don't know. I mean, there are different levels of corruption. I don't like calling it an assassination. It's clearly an assassination. What are you talking about? Assassination is of like world leaders and of important people. I think when you kill low life criminals, all right. Well, what does Sicario I wouldn't mean? call it? Huh? What is, What does the word Sicario mean? Dagger man in Latin. <laughs> okay. What does it mean? And how do how do the Spaniards use it? Oh, yeah, apparently yeah. it means assassin. There, it just, means assassin. He's an assassin. Alejandro is clearly an assassin. Assassin's Creed. <laughs> It's coming out soon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I like the video game series. He's not only going to kill presidents. I know. I just I, I don't like saying that they assassinated a drug warlord because I feel like it elevates and gives a certain stature to the drug lord. Did you see that guy's control. house? Yeah. Did you see what he had? What he was dealing with there? I like that scene. Apparently, it's um, brutal. But I, and I don't know if you fight fire with fire. I mean, that's the thing. I didn't mind the choices that Del Nice uh, or. Del Toro mates, uh-huh. you know, and killing the kids first in that scene, and the wife, and letting the guy have a moment to look at his dead family before he dies too. Well, we're in spoilers. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, so I, I didn't mind that. Right. I, I could understand why you do it. I don't know in the long run if that's going to win the war, or yeah, if that I, just makes everyone become more violent. It, yeah, I, I don't think that they, that he cares if it wins a war or not. He's just killing the guy that killed his family. Yeah, for him it's all about revenge. And he even says a line like, "The other guy's like, it's just it's not personal." I, I guess uh, Fausto is his name, and he's this drug lord. And he's like, it, it, "Nothing was personal." And Alejandro's like, "For me, it is." And then he shoots the kids. He says after uh, telling them to keep eating their food, <laughs> keep eating your dinner, kids. This was another alteration made. Uh, in Sicario, according to alternate endings, uh, and 
I guess I got this off of IndieWire, the scene where Alejandro kills Fausto's entire family before shooting them changed. Originally, it was uh, the family was sent away by the cook, and then he gave Fausto the option of living or dying. Fausto opts to survive, but Alejandro kills him anyway, before telling his wife, maybe you take his money and go hide and raise your children far from here. But they made this change. What what type of an option is that? Do you want to live or do you want to die? Uh, I, ch- I choose life. Well, it's it, it's a call to what he says to Kate later. Uh, okay, also, yeah. so it's a, that's sort of a connection thing too. Um, what do you think about that 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 change? I think that improves the film. The changing it to do it the way that he does it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I like the way it is in the film. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it's brutal to kill a man's family and to have him watch it, but it feels real to me. Yeah. I, you know, the Del Toro character, if he's going to be the type of guy who's going to go on this mission, risk his life, who's upset that he's lost his family, I think that's the decision he makes. He's got to be that hard-nosed there and there doesn't need to be any redeeming qualities and i like that they don't give him any redeeming qualities right well I mean, except or, he saves her he's the deus ex machina well, there's uh, a strange when, connection that they have uh, uh the, and alejandro he saves her when the assassin well you don't he, want to call him an assassin but the murderer i want comes, to call him the punisher yeah, okay. that's what he's going to be in uh, the john new season bernthal of, uh what is he uh seduce her seduces her in a bar yeah. and brings kate back to her apartment and then he appears out of nowhere. The Deus Ex Machina in the middle. Yeah, of the but film. they want to also interrogate that guy and find out what he knows. Yeah, I mean, like she may were... have been used for bait. Yeah, but he's not redeemable, and I like that they they don't give him a nice scene where you really feel for the guy. No, and he doesn't ask for it either. The character doesn't need it. He mm-hmm. just needs revenge. He's consumed by that. But it's odd though that she doesn't shoot him in the end. Her choice not it's not odd because it's in keeping with her character, but she had the option and he kind of gave her that too. She never kills anyone unless it's a, it's a survival moment. Like she has to survive right. at the beginning of the film when she's getting shot at during the raid on the house. She has to kill that guy or else he's going to kill her. And then during the border but crossing, aren't there's a both... guy shooting at her. She ducks and returns yeah. fire. I was thinking they're both ref- reflexes. Yeah. And I think in both instances, the guy shoots first, like Greedo mm-hmm. in Star Wars. If anything, her looking at him and trying to decide if she's going to kill him reminded me a lot of Deliverance. There's a scene in that movie where Burt Reynolds is holding the bow and arrow on a hillbilly, and he's got to decide whether or not he wants to shoot him. In is this the, a spoiler? It, it, it's, it's in the movie, and in the movie, okay. I mean, it's halfway through. He's got to decide, do I kill this guy? Do I become primitive like uh-huh. this, you know? Do I become uncivilized? In the original novel, this is like a four or five page scene as he's trying to think about the implications. In the movie, it's just boom. Right. He has got he, he fires, that. he never thinks. In, in this film, you can see her character going through a range of emotions and she's clearly thinking about this. She's grappling with her decision at the end. Yeah, they they also changed the ending overall. Um originally it involved them getting in a fight, much like the fight that she had with her um murderer mm-hmm. or Berenthal or Bernthal or whatever, the Punisher, the guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the end of the movie, the way it's written, the fight's over and she's examining herself and he lifts up her shirt and exposes her breasts. And they got together, Benicio Del Toro uh, and Emily Blunt and the director, and they're like, this ending just isn't working. It doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. Let's do something else. And then they came up with this sort of on the set. So I'm sure that the screenwriter wasn't proud of that either or happy (laughs) that they changed those thoughts, but I think it makes for a much better movie. I mean, it may have worked in his head. It may have worked on the page, but when you get actors on a set reading the lines, going through the motions, sometimes it just doesn't work. It doesn't come alive. Yeah. I thought it worked. I thought the whole thing worked except for maybe the B story with uh, the corrupt cop, but. I don't know. I wish I knew who was the uh, fight coordinator on this. Who who was doing all the second unit direction, all the action scenes. I bet you can find that out. I know. I, 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 should, I was just thinking because there are some really, really talented people working in the industry, and hopefully those people get a chance to be a, a director. There are the two brothers who directed John uh, Wick. John Wick, yeah, and they started off doing special effects and stunt work. They worked with Keanu Reeves on the Matrix films. And those guys bring a new level of action to films that I don't think we've been seeing 
you know, previously. Conversely, there are some bad fight scene coordinators out there. Case in point, Jane got a gun and uh, child 44. So, oh, yeah. And so if that, you're good at your craft, then you're, you might rise to the top. Well, and we were talking about that with the Revenant and that opening scene where, you know, it's all one shot mm. and just having things choreographed and everything makes sense. Characters, actions, you're not having to try and cover over bad logic with quick edits and right. close ups where you're not really sure what's going on. Like in Jane got a gun. You can barely understand when they're pulling a guy into a cellar. <laughs> it, the, action, it, it, the, the action is framed so tightly. I'm like, what is going what? on here? Say what? And it's a very basic action that's going on. You uh, could have figured that out with a long shot. Just framed it like that. Or even a medium shot would have helped us out. Instead, we've got all these crazy close-ups of a guy's shirt. That was our review of Jane Got a yeah, Gun for you. Yeah. We promised it. Sorry to we ruin delivered. that film. <laughs> they go in a cellar. Yeah, they go into a cellar. It's a- that's not really a spoiler. There's a cellar there. There's some guns. Yeah, but I Jane like, had one. Like that scene on uh, the border crossing, the geography of Sicario. Of, of Sicario. Yeah, let's go back to our film uh-huh. of the week. You understand the geography. You understand people's sight lines and what's going on, even when they're driving through that crazy city uh-huh. in Mexico. And, you know, they're going down all these turning and twisting roads. I always felt like I knew where I was and what characters were looking at, what their motivations were. Mm-hmm. That's really, really good editing when you have these long scenes with no dialogue or with limited dialogue and you still understand stuff and everything advances the plot. Mm-hmm. The so. movement of the uh, scene, like even the, the objects within the scene we're talking about, I'm thinking about the line of uh, SUVs as mm-hmm. they move through that city and uh, the way that works. To just prepare, I mean, that's the pace of the movie for me. You said parts of it were slow, but I, I thought for the most part it, it kept up that pace when I they're think speeding some through the city. People would find the movie slow because there's not always a lot of dialogue. Right. And there is an intensity to some of the actors. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you, now you saw this twice, right? Saw this twice. Did you catch my visual reference and the, almost made the uh, metaphor, visual metaphor of the year? I don't remember. Graver waves at everybody. He's constantly waving, showing uh-huh. his hand. No? You didn't notice that? No. That, that was that obvious. Didn't, that, didn't, that was an obvious That, that just didn't strike me. Yeah. Right. I, and I pointed it out in the Laffy Award show. You did? You did. Um, and yet you still ignored it. If, if people are still trying to understand what this movie's like, could you compare it in tone and pace to another film? Because I, I know I have an answer. I'm not sure you're going to agree with it. Well, I mean, for me... Parts of The Departed are like this. Nicholson's role notwithstanding. I mean, not his role, but his acting. Okay. He's a little bit over the top. But it has that... I mean, it's got the moral ambiguity and the um, also the you know, intention to detail and production design. Why? What's your movie? No Country for Old Men. All right, yeah. But, I mean, I, Very I, similar. I, yeah, and I, I can see Departed, too. Departed is a little bit more campy. I mean, it's it heads more in the direction of camp. Well, that's what you get when everyone's doing a Boston accent, too. Right. I was trying to think of the last perfect movie I saw. Because no movies are really perfect. I don't think there are any perfect movies. But You've never seen a perfect film. I don't know. No Country for Old Men is pretty close. There Will Be Blood would be my pick. They're both in there. and They came out in the same year. No Country for Old Men, though, there are some problems I have with it. And and the more I think about it, the more, the more they become obvious. They're like... Um, I don't know, a fly landing on the Mona Lisa. No, Although I don't think that's a perfect, that perfect painting film. either. In fact, the day I saw uh, There Will Be Blood, I saw another perfect film. And you're going to roll your eyes, but as far as for what it is, it's perfect. Rambo, the fourth Rambo film. For what it is, for Rambo, what it Rambo, the out, fourth Rambo film. Wait a minute. Rambo. Yeah, it's the fourth one in the series. <laughs> okay. It's a perfect fi- For what it is, it's perfect. All right. That's it, just, it, it you, hits you, its you tone. have no idea how ridiculous you sound. No. No, you can have a movie that hits its tone and it's just Well, hitting your tone doesn't it make it a perfect movie. For the acting, what the story is, it just all works. Home Alone is a perfect movie. All right, see, your ideas of perfection are very different than mine. For me, perfection means perfect. <laughs> For you, it means uh, reaching a, a goal. No, I, wouldn't, I would not change anything in Home Alone. I would not change anything in Rambo. There will be blood. I wouldn't change a frame of that film. Hmm. And if I'm not going to change anything, it must be because it's perfect. 
I can always see room for improvement. There's always room for improvement. Yeah, there's nothing perfect about Groundhog Day. I, I wouldn't argue that that's a perfect movie. I think it's well crafted. It's close, but it's not. And it's. I think it's hard. You can always find flaws in anything. I'm not changing anything of that film. It's All right. done. I'll watch it and I'll tell you the improvements I would make. I could make improvements in my mind to Sicario. Because we're dealing with a movie that we have to watch. But like I, by that token, I could say Uncle Buck is a perfect movie. And it's not. It's not perfect. There's nothing. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't quite land all the way. It's a very good film, though. Even this movie has, uh, I guess, coincidental mistakes that make it into the film that work, but they're not part of the. They weren't part of the design. Like uh, when Kate enters the tunnel, Mm -hmm. apparently she smashes her head, and they leave that in there. And Denis Villeneuve thought that it was a good. uh, I mean, it worked. This is kind of what would happen. Adds to the realism. So, yeah. That uh, doesn't make it a perfect movie. I don't know if this it, is a perfect movie or It not. might make it's, it imperfect. It's close. Yeah. This is uh, of a higher order than Home Alone and Uncle Buck. And I haven't seen I'm Rambo, not saying Uncle so Buck I'll, is perfect. I'll stave off my I, I'd derision. like to hear what the rest of our audience says about what's a perfect right. film or not, or if they have any pits for what a perfect film Fair is. Fair enough. A, a mo- you know, and I guess we don't even agree on the definition. Of no, we can't even agree on that. Like but, most things, we can't agree. Um. Did you see we got some uh, viewer mail? I did. I did see some of that feedback. I I think it's interesting that on a show where we're talking about the best film of 2015, we we have an early candidate, a write-in for worst film of 2016. Oh, yeah. And this is our resident completionist for Bob De Niro. Yeah, uh, He's an apologist, in fact, for Bob De Niro. Tony C. wrote in, he went and saw Bad Grandpa. Or, no, Dirty Grandpa. Yeah, don't don't get yeah, that mixed yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, one of those it's very similar good. to yeah. uh, the Jackass <laughs> film. Uh, Dirty Grandpa, he said, it is by far De Niro's worst film. He even told me it's worse than Rocky and Bullwinkle. Because when I heard he said it was the worst film, instantly I went, worse than Rocky and Bullwinkle? Huh. Worse than Moose and Squirrel? Huh. And no? he said, yeah. So you won't be seeing that one. I think I've got to stay away from that one. Got to pass on that. Maybe mm. we can make that the uh, part of the bet when we do our next box office challenge. Whoever loses has to go watch Dirty Grandpa. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then report back about how bad it is. Got to watch it. All right. That's, a, that's, a, that's actually so, not a bad... Oh, uh, uh, we appreciate Tony C. writing in. Yeah, thanks, Tony C. I feel fine. If uh, other people want to send in their comments, uh, suggestions for Best Picture, or what they thought of Sicario, they can email the show at thelaughpodcast at gmail.com. They can tweet us at thelaughpodcast, or they can uh, send us a message on goodoldfacebook.com slash thelaughpodcast. Excellent. So we will be reviewing next week Hail Caesar. We're also going to be starting up our Oscar, our Laugh Goes to the Oscars shows, and those shows are going to be a little bit shorter, a little bit more succinct. I think just an overview of the of the best picture nominations. Uh, even though we've talked about some of these movies at length uh, in other shows, I think we're going to try to address them maybe with some special guests for depending on the movie. Um, I guess if you've seen Full Metal Jacket. I have seen Full Metal Jacket. And you're you're aware of Gunnery Sergeant Hartman? Yes, very much so. All right, this is my Gunny Sergeant. So, wait a minute, what were you going to say? Perfect movie. <laughs> Might be close. <laughs> if you ladies leave my island, if you survive recruit training, you will be a weapon. You will be a minister of death praying for war. But until that day, you are pukes. You are the lowest form of life on earth because I am hard. You will not like me. But the more that you hate me, the more you will learn. I am hard, but I am fair. Here you are worthless. And my order is to weed out all the non-hackers who do not pack the gear to serve at my beloved core. Do you maggots understand that? (laughs) So, for Mr. Two Frames over there on the L-Train, Poxhead, Baronum, everybody. There be dragons. Dragons.